Welcome in, Mo. Glad to have you here. How are you doing today? <laughs> Pretty good. How are you? How is everyone? I'm doing well. Chat looks hyped. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I, I've i been good personally. And we had a really cozy morning this morning. So that was absolutely super nice. Um, but Very good. good. <laughs> that's and for me, that's good because we're rolling into a pretty serious topic today with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it is a heavy one. It's a heavy mm -hmm. topic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me on and approaching this difficult topic with me. It's so much better when you have somebody else to have the conversation with. Yeah, I know it's one that a lot of people are really uncomfortable having. So I really appreciate yeah. you coming on and talking about it. But this is something mm -hmm. you do fairly regularly, right? You talk about death yes. a lot. That seems yeah. a bit dark. Why, why do you talk about death? What do you do? For sure. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm a professional animal skeleton preparator as my career, and I am a pet mortician. And so what that means is I specialize in creating, creating custom skeletal pet companion memorials for people after their pets die. So I'm somebody who actually pre-plans with families before their pets die. Um, maybe their pet's getting up in age or um, is... Uh, coming down with a diagnosis of a disease or something like that. And so I pre-plan with families, well, what do you want done with your pet when they die? Do you want to have them buried? Do you want to have them cremated? Do you want to save uh, a piece or part of their skeleton? Which is where my specialty lies, is in preserving the bones. But I can also help the family facilitate those other needs, like um, going with them to the vet to have their pet put down. Sometimes people just need a little extra support and a little extra love um, when, when they're dealing with the loss of, of anyone, and that includes pets. Um, so for me, that was uh, something that just really impacted my life once I, I started doing it and I, I had to keep helping folks. So yeah, um, I'm also an artist and an educator. Um, on skeletal processing and building. So I've taught classes in the past. Um, I've hosted workshops. Um, I've done work for natural history museums and built skeletons for them. Um, so yeah, I, I do work with death um, every day. Um, I, I work with a lot of families who are dealing with grief and actively mourning their pets. Um, and, and beyond that, I have just had a very long and personal experience with death being very present in my life from a very young age. So it all kind of rolls together. Yeah. Thank you. Also, we mm -hmm. had a question from Zetatica. Is that different from a taxidermist? It is. Yeah. So, so taxidermy is generally working with um, the hide or skin of an animal. Um, can, and it, that's completed by uh, usually a foam like form. So it's actually a sculpted foam form that's put inside, the skin covers it. That's taxidermy. Um, I do skeletal preparation. So I don't actually do a hide preservation or taxidermy. Um, I deal with just the bones. And what that looks like with somebody's pet is that I'm actually able to give the family back any extra soft remains like a skin and they can bury it, they can have it cremated um, as well as get the skeletal articulation. So um, yeah, I, I usually don't work with um, hides or anything like that. I do know some of the processes though. It just never really appealed to me as much as working with the skeleton. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of um, course. Very interesting work that you do for sure. <laughs> um, it is. <laughs> I meant to open my community talking a little bit about how this is a dark topic and I want everyone to check in with themselves. Um, we switched it over mm -hmm. pretty quickly from like feminism and then all of a sudden we're like, by the way, death. Um, yeah. This is a dark topic and this is yeah. kind of a dark time for a lot of us. I don't want to necessarily overwhelm mm -hmm. anyone in the community with this. So please check in with yourselves, make sure you're ready. But I do want to make sure that we have this conversation because Mm -hmm. It's so important. It's so important. And the reality is, um, I was trying to bring Mo on earlier. We had plans for you to, 
to <laughs> to have this conversation. Then I was like, by the way, pandemic. Hey, Mo, are you free yeah, yeah. now? <laughs> so um, that's a, a little unfortunate, the timing, but I think it's an important yeah. thing to bring up now. So definitely a content warning, but um, important, important information to have. So if you don't feel yeah. like you can handle it in this moment, that's okay. Catch it over on the YouTube later when you are feeling my YouTube later when you're feeling better. Um, because these are important tools and that, that rolls me into why do you feel like it's important to talk about death, Mo? Right. Um, so obviously, um, my, my work and my career, like I just kind of explained, um, is a big part of why I think it's important to talk about death and dying, um, in, in a general sense. Um, it's something that if you're a living creature, your time is finite. And it's something that you, we kind of got to deal with at some point in, in all of our lives. We're going to experience a loss. And so kind of being able to open a dialogue about something that's so difficult can actually help prepare your brain for when those things do eventually happen to you. Um, so, so for me, a lot of... of my passion around this subject comes from my own life and like my own personal experiences. So for me, my younger brother was born back in the mid nineties with a cleft in his trachea. And what that meant was that we were told he had a 2% chance of living. And we were told this for five years. Um, he had gone through over 30 plus surgeries. He had feeding tube nurses. Um, he had a uh, degenerative lung disease, um, more problems than you would ever just see in one baby. My brother had them all. So my childhood was a little different than other people's. I was homeschooled because we couldn't go to school for fear of bringing home something that would make my brother die, mm -hmm. essentially. It was that serious of an issue. So yeah. Wow. We were homeschooled. And on top of that, my parents got divorced when I was very young. So my mom was raising all four of us. Um, and we had this very, very sick little baby to, to try mm -hmm. to keep alive and try to take care of. Um, so it was a lot of hospital visits, um, a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, specialists. Um, my childhood was not very typical. Um, so I was actually exposed to anatomy and physiology at such a young age because we had to understand what was happening to our younger brother, my sisters mm -hmm. and I. Um, it was really important uh, for our mom to kind of impart on us, this is what's not wrong with him, but what's going on with his physiology. These are the problems that he's facing. And as a family, we kind of got to face it together. Um, <laughs> so that's what we did. Um, and so, yeah, the first eight years of his life were really traumatic and it was traumatic for us as well. Um, and just when you're very young and, and being explained to that your sibling might not come home, it's a lot. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's a trauma I didn't realize was a trauma until my aunt died in 2004. So it'll be 16 years next month that my aunt died. That was the one that that made it click in my head, the severity of my childhood and and what we as a family faced and, and what my brother went through as, as such a small little human. Um, it I got it mm -hmm. in it. It was devastating. Um, so I was very close with my aunt. We were all very tight knit family and they lived um, on the East Coast. And so when my aunt died, my mom was my cousin's legal guardian. So we moved, we packed up everything, our whole lives. And in one week, we moved to a new state, wow. moved in with my cousins and were in the middle of funerals, wakes, um, mourning you know, with, with the whole family. And it was a lot. So we lived there for a year. And then I came back to Colorado. 
Um, my cousins, one of them graduated and went to college. The other one, um, his dad ended up caring for him. So we ended up moving back to Colorado. So my life was really just no stability, changes just mm -hmm. happening, no real sense of um, roots or, or grounding. And when I got back to Colorado, I, I entered eighth grade in public school and I'm like shaking my head like I want to talk to people about what I've been through. I want to talk to people I started making friends with before I moved about why I moved. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I had basically lost all of my friends that I made the one year I went to school in Colorado. Um, people didn't know how to talk to me. And granted, we're talking about middle schoolers, middle, what middle schoolers yeah. know how to, how to, how to talk to their friend about the loss of, of a family member. Um, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people don't in general. So I felt really alone I, and, and and just kind of tossed out in into the world and without a lot of preparation without a lot of like knowledge on how to deal with grief and trauma and mourning and when these feelings kind of last and build and and remain and how do you how do you come up with the right tools to continue waking up every day and and finding purpose and and meaning in your life and for me, that came in the form of heavy therapy. I started going to grief counseling, um, small grief groups, and doing things like that through high school. I faced some very, very difficult times, um, very, very painful times. And it's just, you just keep waking up and you yeah. try again the next day and you add another tool into your tool belt so you can try again. Um, after high school, that's when I discovered my skeleton preparation. So I, I started a mentorship under three different people who are professionals in the industry. And um, I, it, it changed my life. Having people who were willing to talk with me about death and dying, but not necessarily mourning or grief, but just death and dying in a different way perspective and in a different way. Let's just look at death and dying away from my own personal loss and then put it into a different context. And maybe we can talk about it in this way. Mm -hmm. And 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 then, of course, the physical introduction to working with skeletons and bones, you start you start to just feel a little bit different inside. That's what happened to me. And then one of my mentors died in 2014 very suddenly. So that was it. That was the catalyst. And that's when I, I decided I was going to do bone building as my career and work with people with grief and mourning and with their pets and stuff like that. But more importantly, I wanted to talk to people yeah. about these things. So that's why I started my Twitch stream <laughs> a couple years ago was to bring these conversations um, outside of a bubble and bring it out into the world to help facilitate it with people who don't have anybody to talk to, who Absolutely. isn't afraid of just saying, hey, let's talk about death and dying. This shit sucks. This yeah. sucks. This Absolutely. hurts. Man, like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. First off, thank so, yeah, you that's so much. A little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing so much personal um just personal things that have happened to you the feelings yep. associated with that that isolation those are yep. really deep and painful emotions that a lot of people Absolutely. struggle to talk with i'm grateful mm -hmm. for the community i have here that we can open up about these things but so many people like you were saying like of course in middle school how are people going to know to how to handle that we don't talk to children yeah. about death we think that we need to uh -uh. shield them from that but that is a exactly. reality of the world and they may have a friend like you or they may be going through that themselves mm -hmm. that it is something to talk about so i really really appreciate you yeah. coming forward and and having these yeah. conversations with people and changing people's minds and making this conversation a little easier conversation mm -hmm. after conversation so thank you um 
I do um, chat, I'll let you know that we will take questions at the end of sections and at the very end of stream or at the very end of the conversation, we will take all questions. So try to keep them related and I will pull related questions from chat for Mo. Um, something that someone was wondering if you're comfortable sharing and only mm -hmm. ever answer if you're comfortable, but someone was wondering, I think about what age you were <clears throat> when you, uh when your brother was born um so let's see i think i was just about four mm. about four mm. and a half mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so i was young i was i was the baby of the family um i was a little kid um my older sisters have different memories and and a different you know, not a different perspective. We obviously, we, we've all come through this together. And so, but you know, my, my sisters were older than me. And so they saw things and process things in a different way than I, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was a little kid. And so I actually really relied on my older siblings when I was young um, to, to kind of be there for me. And, and the three of us kind of bonded in that way of, um working through some of this stuff together um mm -hmm. because they were a little bit older than me and had a little bit of a different understanding of what was happening um but yeah yeah i was pretty little when when we found out about uh my brother when he was born and stuff mm. yeah absolutely thank you for sharing mm -hmm. i i have had a little death education more formal death education through college and it was probably right. one of the most powerful experiences i had in college um wow. yeah. and and i noticed something interesting and i'm curious if you've noticed the same thing as you've talked through death um talked about death is i've recognized that death has some similarities with other losses that we have in the way that we process it um, obviously they're they're different yeah. but there are similarities so yeah, i feel like i've definitely. gotten better at handling things like <clears throat> breakups or mm -hmm. other forms of losses by yes. talking about death which seems odd seems a little odd but but have you yes, had that experience and and yes like would you expand on things that you've learned uh talking about death that help you in other aspects of your life because obviously it helps helps you talking about death processing losing someone right. processing your own death but what other right. areas does it help it, you in well the big thing i mean so when when we experience like a death i think it's kind of this twofold thing where we experience grief because of love um but we also experience grief um because of change right as humans we're really like we love ritual we love um uh like having this like schedule having this like kind of uh semblance of control and when we experience a loss whether it's death or you're fired from your job um our brains process that like in the same way it's 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 a loss it's a change it, and it's something that that alters like not just like the course of your day sometimes but but the course of your life it can it can leave you with with a new identity it can leave you like just everything looks different and your perspective changes so um there's a a thanatologist who which is the study of death and dying and she's amazing her name is colin perry and she coined the term shadow loss so shadow loss is a loss in life not a loss of life um and i love that term ever since i found out about it i am just like this makes so much sense to me um so a shadow loss could be something like losing your job unexpectedly. It could be a miscarriage. It could be, um, you know, so uh, basically a loss where where you there was potential there and now it's gone. Mm -hmm. The change has happened and and it's time to <laughs> figure out where you go from there. So I think that like for me learning how or learning the different tools from my tool belt with dealing with death and dying has kind of led me to realize that change is going to happen loss of all kinds 
it's going to happen and and the scope of control that i truly have in my life is not as much as i think it is right like Mm -hmm. it's kind of that trick our brain plays on us to kind of keep us safe and mentally healthy um to protect us from this like crushing weight of like our own mortality (laughs) so so it kind of like cushions us in and yeah i i think that like the coping skills definitely apply in those other areas where like you were talking about um dealing with a the loss of a relationship Mm -hmm. um which is like considered a shadow loss right the person Mm -hmm. didn't die but they're no longer a part of your life anymore um and you're not a part of theirs so kind of learning how to accept these huge monumental things can help you start to put into perspective those smaller losses and how to take a deep breath and go, all right, like my identity is changing again. It's okay. It's okay. I might have many faces for the rest of my life, but my core is still me. My path is going to wiggle and change, but I just got to keep adapting to it. And I think that that's like a big thing with with um, any kind of loss is learning how to adapt to those changes and, and slowly find a new familiar because your old familiar might not be there anymore. But that doesn't mean there isn't a potential to create a new familiar for yourself. So, yes, yeah. I love that. The I, I always use the term new normal. That's something I really got yes. from my death I and dying that. class. Um, that being that. the perspective change for, okay, this is gone. What's my new normal? What are things I'm reinvesting yeah. in? Another tool, you've been talking a little bit about the tools in your tool belt. Um, and I think that there's so many tools that we can learn regarding death and how they transfer over to the other losses, the shadow losses in our lives that Mm -hmm. I really, I really love that term so much. Um, It's those tools are, are amazing and powerful, but some of them we are losing right now. So one of them I talk about, or, or I haven't talked about yet, but I want to talk about is funerals, the importance of funerals, not for the dead, but for the living though, people do have their preferences as to how they want Mm -hmm. that to go. And we want that respected, but I learned a lot through death education about the importance of funerals. I lost a friend to suicide that was, um, kind of far away you know, Mm -hmm. in another state. And I was never someone to go to funerals. I thought they were horrible. I hated them. Everyone was sad. I remembered my grandpa's funeral where I didn't even really know that guy that well, but I saw his glasses on his nose and I cried. Like, you know, it's just terrible. Funerals are the worst. I'm not going to do that. And then I also felt pretty um, unsure about going to that funeral for a variety of reasons anyhow. And it was very difficult Um, I didn't realize it at the time that this played into me not being able to recognize that he was dead because he was so far away and I always expected he would just call me. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that and it never happened and I'd have dreams about that and it was very difficult to process. And then I went through this course on death and dying and Mm -hmm. how to cope with that and the psychology around death and dying and I realized how important funerals were for the living to help solidify that. Not everyone needs them, but it can be very helpful for a lot of people or even just a memorial. Now that I'm thinking Mm -hmm. about it, I probably should do something like that still because it's, you know, (laughs) I haven't um, thought about it since then, but um, in college, I didn't really have the time. But so then I started pushing. Yeah, yeah. So I started pushing to, to go to funerals and now I attend funerals now my family probably thinks Mm -hmm. i'm a freak i struggle to make it to weddings but i'm at every funeral (laughs) they probably not a freak (laughs) not a freak but i'm like i mean many people do see funerals as a celebration of life Mm, yeah so if you think celebrating life is weird and creepy then i got something (laughs) else for you (laughs) i hear you i absolutely hear you i think it's but i yeah, I totally. Yeah. What what you were just talking about, about um, 
not having that that sense of closure or not mm-hmm. closure closure i hate the word closure when it comes to this stuff because there there really isn't closure, closure. yeah things don't close when it comes to this right mm-hmm. love doesn't just stop right yeah <laughs> no so it's i lost my train of thought okay okay come back brain we're talking about the funerals. importance of funerals. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, a lot of folks, like you were saying, truly do feel better having attended a funeral. Mm-hmm. Um, many people still do practices of sitting vigil with their loved one's body. Um, many people in in many different cultures and religious practices around the world have very specific rites and rituals beyond just the funeral that go into loving and caring for that person, essentially sending them them off on their way and saying goodbye and it and it's not just an expression of love for for the deceased person it's for the living people to look at that that body and say this life has ended Mm -hmm. this is it's over this person has gone they're no longer in their body anymore but i am and that's okay and it's hurting me so bad Mm -hmm but it's okay. Yeah. And that can be incredibly powerful for many people to have that that experience of just attending a funeral and not even necessarily like an open casket funeral. Not everybody wants to see uh, their loved one's body, but for many people just being in that physical presence and then of course surrounded by their support network of Mm -hmm. family and friends and other people who are experiencing similar feelings to you can be such a powerful um, healing experience when you look around and your pain is reflected on everybody else's face around you and you realize that you're not alone, you're not isolated in your grief, that this has touched all of these people's lives and this is your way to come together Um, and support each other. So yeah, funerals are really, as much as, you know, people will plan their funeral, their own funeral, and want it to look a certain way, it's really for the people who are left behind. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really what it's for, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. No, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's really nice to bring a combination together. And I know that we talked a little bit about how if someone plans their own funeral, plans their own death, plans their own um, everything Mm -hmm. around that, that seems kind of dark, but it can help relieve the stress of the family arguing over those details. And I think that's incredible. So I will Mm -hmm. absolutely be planning my own stuff. I want to make sure it's super freaking eco-friendly. So (laughs) let me know if you want any help at all. I I have so much info on Um, eco-friendly after death planning and options and how to like, yeah, I I have so much information for you, Lumi. I also would like a very green and eco-friendly burial for myself. So yeah. (laughs) I'm so happy. Yeah. I think, um, well, yeah. And and like you were just talking about with the planning, if you're planning ahead of time for these things, it's not, like you said, it's not just for you, it's for the peace and mind of, of your friends and, and family and mm-hmm. loved ones. Because you don't keep those plans to yourself, you gotta tell somebody about them, otherwise yeah. how are they going to, to, to fulfill your wishes? So, so the important part, right, is, is making those plans, but even more importantly, telling the people who, who are going to be in charge of those wishes what you want done that gives them peace of mind because you got to remember someone has to actually enact all of this and, and make it happen for you. So if that person has years to be like, oh shit, Lumi, you already gave me your plans. I know exactly what you want. I can give you the funeral that, that you desired. And I know all of those details that are going to go into it. I can make that happen. And I'm prepared for what it's going to look like. And that means that I can help prepare anybody else who is in your life who may be attending. So I think that it's like, it's one of those things where a lot of times people 
don't do the planning and don't think about this stuff. And then the family is left to deal with all of this Mm -hmm. in the middle of the tragedy, in the middle of the unexpected. And that is so hard. It is Mm -hmm. so hard to, to plan a funeral or a wake when the unexpected is happening and it's in your face and all you want to do is curl up and cry you don't want to deal with logistics yeah but if you have the plan in place it can really help um ease a little bit of uh the logistical stuff doesn't make the pain go away but it can help make things just go a little smoother yeah and i also heard people um talk about that brings down the bickering between family as well you have yes. that person's wishes and yes. you don't have to fight over the details with your family as you're going through this grief. And uh, I think that can be very powerful and important too. So it's that combination of respecting that person who has passed away or, or died, whatever words um, yep. work best for that. Um, it is helping respect their wishes as well mm-hmm. as um make it easier for the living and make that as you were saying that process so much smoother no arguing not having to figure those details out i think that's very powerful um but something that we're rolling into this pandemic we're here we're here in this pandemic and i'm already seeing i guess new york city has a like pop-up morgue that they're putting bodies in or or something i've already been seeing news about it and Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing, I know we lost a disability activist recently, not related to COVID, but Jeez. people are saying, I don't even know how to mourn. I, I saw a yeah. family recently on Twitter saying, my, my sister just died and her daughters and husband are alone dealing with this and we can't go mourn with them. They're alone yeah. handling the situation with yes. none of that support. So... Mm-hmm. What do we do during COVID not having these tools or maybe not having them in the same way? What what do you recommend? Right. Um, yeah, the landscape has changed for what folks are able to do right now in terms mm-hmm. of grief and I or mourning, excuse me, grief. So I do want to be clear for anybody who doesn't know, grief is internal feelings of loss, right? Mourning is when you take those feelings and you express them on the mm-hmm. outside of you. So that's what we do uh, when we have a funeral, right? Like Lumi and I were talking about. Um, that's mourning. That's when you take that pain and you put it outside of you um, and go from there. So A big thing when we're mourning is physical support, being able to cry and hug another loved one, um, that that physicality to it is really important for a lot of people. Even just being able to gather um, and have a big group dinner together um, and talk and share memories, a lot of people don't have that right now. And it's devastating. There, there's truly like no other way to say it. Like this is a devastating thing to experience. Um, so traditionally, right, depending on culture and religion, you you would do your rituals, you would have your physical interaction. You can't have those right now. So what do we do? There are things. There are things. Don't feel hopeless, right? Mm-hmm. So what you can do is you could create an at-home service. It's going to be strange because you won't have a funeral director to help walk you through the steps. So it's going to look however you want it to. And this is something I work through with a lot of uh, the the families I work with who lose pets is how to create um, moments of love and and tenderness and mourning when you don't have your pet with you. Because when I take somebody's pet to, to work on them, they're sometimes with me for up to two years. Mm-hmm. That's a long time for someone to not have that physical memorial with them, right? Mm-hmm. So they're separated from their pet. So I, I work with families a lot on how to do things during that time period when they're they're not able to be with their pet. And I truly think it applies 
to people too. So creating an at-home funeral service. So if you're sheltered in place, like many of us are, you can't leave your house. It's dangerous to gather in groups of people. You don't want to be spreading this inf or virus around. So plan an at-home service. And that's something that you can set up through video calls and you could share with as many or as few people as you want. You could have it just for yourself. Just for you, ever you want that to look. Um, I would say cook your, your loved one's favorite meal. If you can get the ingredients and you know, oh, I know what they like to make. Spend a couple hours in your kitchen and make that meal as if you're making it for that person who you've lost. Then you get to eat it. <laughs> um, I often recommend creating a memory box. Um, so that's something that I think is a great tool because you can keep it in a place where you can access it, but you don't necessarily have to have that box open all the time right? Mm -hmm. So that's something where you can put um, photos, uh, special items that maybe hold meaning to your loved one who you've lost and to you. So something that has that, that sentimental value um, and that connection, that memory connection, put it in that box. When, when you're feeling like you're in the place for it, you're like, my heart is hurting. I just, I want to be with my person. Pull that box out, open it up, and just go through it gently and slowly and and piece by piece and put it away when you're not in that space to do that. I think the memory boxes are powerful because it gives you a little bit of control of, I'm not in that space. I, I can't, I don't want to see their pictures today. It hurts too bad. Mm -hmm. And you can put it, put it back on that special uh, area in your house um, and then visit it when you have that uh, capacity to sit with it. Um, I would say um, make a care package for another person who's also grieving, right? This huge, so this yeah. is this is kind of like a twofold thing, right? Because you usually when when you're in the midst of grieving, your your focus is internal. It's on you. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath and do something for someone else who's also experiencing that same loss, right? So another friend or family member who you know is also grieving, extend that love to them. And when you do that, you're creating a bridge to that other person through grief. And you're saying, hey, I see you. And this hurts both of us. Maybe we can talk about this. How do you feel? Do you want to talk? I kind of want to talk and you might be surprised at how many people really want to talk about their pain. They really do. People want to be heard and they don't, they don't want to be dismissed or forgotten about. And a lot of times that's how it feels when we, when we have someone die in our life is that no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to acknowledge it. And so we're just alone, but, yeah, so I would say if you're able to extend love to somebody else who's also grieving and, and see if they want to talk with you on the phone or a video call, share a cup of tea virtually and, and cry together. Um, crying is really, really important. I am a huge advocate of if you feel like you're going to cry, fucking cry. Just, I will hug you. It's okay. I mm. promise you. And it it will it will help. It's a great expression of of that pain. So please if you need to cry, please cry. Um I recommend people doing things like lighting candles. I know that um for my grandma, she is a very strict Catholic. So when my aunt died, my grandma has a ritual of going to mass and lighting candles for my aunt. My grandma can't do that right now. My grandma's very high risk. She cannot leave where yeah, she is right now. Absolutely. But a ritual that she's already created for herself is lighting that candle and having that moment with herself and her daughter, who she misses desperately. So like 
having those little rituals that you give to yourself um, can sometimes carry over into your sheltered in place um, mm -hmm. time right now where things are, are tough and you're not able to go and do those things out in the world um, to, to mourn. Cause that's, you know, what my grandma was doing within her ritual of lighting that candle. That's my grandma's outward expression of mourning. So now she can do that same thing, but it's at, at home. Um, I always say create creative outlets, but with a caveat that it's not for everybody. Um, not everybody feels creative when they're grieving. And that's really important to respect. It's really easy to say, Oh, we'll just, just channel your grief into some magical painting. No, that's not going to work for everybody. Some mm -hmm. people just, that's not where they're at at all. So it's really important to remember that like, while creative outlets might help some people, it won't necessarily help everybody. And that's kind of true for everything, right? You kind of got to just Absolutely. find the bits and pieces that work for you. But journaling, painting, drawing, scrapbooking, anything that, that um, kind of gets that out of you um planting your loved one's favorite flower um or planting um like a little potted plant and caring for that life um i've talked with people who have gotten plants after their pets have died because they weren't ready to adopt a new pet and instead started transferring that love into flora and and cultivating life and sometimes i i think that like getting your hands into the soil and, and working with something living like that can be really, really soothing. Um, if anything, just a beautiful distraction for a little bit and something good to focus your mind on too. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Virtual memorials. <laughs> I'm like, I could go on. I got a whole yeah, list. Yeah. I was just, it was interesting because I've been reading a book recently that goes through um, a bunch of different things that, uh, like different little stories about rituals that um, different intersectional feminists have. And one of them was talking about coping with death through gardening and, yes. you know, sweeping away the dead, planting something new and and helping that grow and really cultivating and putting the blood and work into it knowing mm -hmm. full well that again at some point they will lose that garden but that doesn't yeah. mean that you can't grow another you can't you know cultivate another and and make it different yeah. and still beautiful in a different way and still enjoyable in a different way um, yeah. And I think that's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Be I think that's beautiful what you just said. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so there with that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I agree with you. And it really, you know, gardening in, in general really does expose you to the cycles of life and death on these, these other, other levels, right? Because we do, you know, when you're gardening, you are working with with decay, those dead leaves and and mulch and and if you're using, you know, organic fertilizers and stuff like that, like these are these are all things that are tied together, life and death tied together in order to, you know, create something new. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, and I personally find gardening very therapeutic myself. So I I just think being outside in general, even if you just walk outside look up at the sun if you've got it in wherever you live and just let the sun touch your face and your skin and breathe that fresh air and it seems so simple and so silly but it's not it feels really good and really grounding to just be like the sun is warm the ground mm -hmm. is firm the birds are singing grounding and mindfulness techniques are very useful when you're grieving and mourning Absolutely. and just dealing with anxiety or depression in general, like mm -hmm. learning those mindfulness techniques. Oh, they will help you. I promise you even just a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that's something that we're taking a well-being course right now with the community in the Fantastic. discord, a free one from Yale altogether. And that is something oh, we've been talking about. Mindfulness is actually this week. So that's been really nice. Um, I did want to pull in 
this comment by Mika the confused about a shadow sure. loss happening um, and get get your thoughts um, Mika said I know we're mainly talking about loss through death I'd say Mika no 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 um, we will talk it seems very focused around death but these tools as we mentioned expand into these other areas these shadow losses as as Mo was talking about um, but does anyone have advice on loss through distancing? My best friend through undergrad and I shared a lot of deep stuff and really bonded. I always knew she was somewhat conservative, but we got along for the most part. I started putting the pieces together a few months ago that she's actually super transphobic. Mm -hmm. Now I find myself missing our connection, but at the same time thinking of her is super painful. Any thoughts? I wanted to interject a little <sighs> bit with as I was talking about the garden and seeing your comment, um, for me, when I'm losing people, right, I'm losing my mother right now. Um, and, and not that she's gone, but that she's being transphobic, right? And so I recognize that that's an area where I can clear out that relationship and start something new and beautiful there. Find someone who isn't that way and really cultivate um something something else but i would be curious mo do you have anything that you would like to say about that oh that is such a tough one mm -hmm. uh Inka, that's yeah that's a painful situation to be in and i'm very i'm very sorry the loss of a friend in that way um yeah that's rough mm -hmm. and i think Lumi really touched on it well of it hurts but using that like garden metaphor of sometimes you have to clear away you know that like top soil and you got to get to that good stuff to make room for you know more good stuff to put in and it's not going to make it any easier but unfortunately I think there are times in our lives where we grow apart from people we love and and don't see them in the same way as we used to as we grow and then we realize they don't see us in that same way right that fucking sucks mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they are the only person who could ever be your friend I think you have more worth than that. And I think that there will be people in your life who will be there for you and will love you and will support you in all of the ways that you truly deserve as a human being. And I am so sorry that this person was not that person for you. Mm -hmm. But letting that toxicity stay in your garden that's gonna poison you that's gonna hurt you I don't want you to be hurt like that that makes me sad <laughs> I want you to be able to to blossom and grow and and move with your life and with your flow and and not have that pain there that's that's really hard that's tough for me to to know even because I've experienced things with friends that I love very, very much. And I'm still working through that type of loss. And it's hard to have advice or, you know, direction to send people in when dealing with this type of stuff. Because when somebody dies, we have that, that finality to it, right? They're, they're physically no longer in the world. And there's this whole other pain attached to knowing that that other person is still alive. They're still there. They're still out in the world, but they're not, you know, a part of your world anymore. So, yeah, it's definitely complicated. And I'm terribly sorry that you're in this situation. I'm sorry your friend is toxic. Yeah. I, want, I don't want to call them your friend anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have... want to call him your friend. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always it's it's stressful because um, yeah. First off, I always have the problem of I think I can 
fix the transphobe, right? And there are times that you can walk people yeah. through these beliefs. Um, yeah. But it, it always starts like I'm starting to differentiate between people that I can help as like specifically a trans person, people I, I can't help. And um, it's hard to mm -hmm. know that differentiation, it's very hard. But Mika, I hope that I, I see you saying like, I wish I could, but I don't really have anyone else. My other friends range from transphobic to apathetic, so I don't really trust <sighs> them. Um, I am so sorry that you're in that position. And this is something that I am focusing That's on tough. a lot as a you know queer content creator. I'm going through some of those losses too. And how do we, how do we survive through that? How do we build a better tomorrow for ourselves? And it's, you know, tracking down the groups, the communities. I'm lucky I have this community. It has kept me going and finding that new mm -hmm. normal, finding people who are there for you and supporting you through those things. So I'm so sorry to hear about your friend though. Um, that's just dreadful, dreadful. So speaking of which, we just kind of did something that I, I wanted to switch into actually talking about how to support other people. We we can talk yeah. about how to support ourselves and, and that is important in core to making it through mourning, through grief and, and that mourning process of expressing that grief. Um, but also, as we're seeing, we aren't the only ones experiencing loss, whether it is the death in in life or whether it is those shadow losses of losing friends, of having breakups, of breaking apart from people, losing a job, potentially um, all of these other losses. And we are seeing these right now a lot more as well, I feel mm -hmm. like. Um, yeah. And, and I feel like even coming out of the pandemic, we'll see even more. Um, I'm just curious what the breakup rates will be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been curious about that too, actually. I'm like, I really wonder about how long yeah. this is going to go. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think we're going to be needing to support a lot more people mm -hmm. through those losses <laughs> of jobs. We saw unemployment spike. We saw... Um, we're hearing people complain about their partners, not sure how serious <laughs> some of them are. Like, yeah. <laughs> and we're recognizing that people are going to be experiencing those I'm losses. I'm not your mom. And mm -hmm. on I'm top definitely of your daddy. taking care of ourselves through those losses that we might experience, we're all here about community and taking care of our community and helping foster a healthy community. Part of right. that is helping others through their grief and through their mourning process. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you, like how, I guess it starts with a conversation, right? Or that attempt mm -hmm. at the conversation. I never thought of, right. you know, the care package as a way to, hey, you know, we're both facing this. Maybe we can talk about this. Oh. That is awesome. Um, yeah. I always thought of it starting with a conversation, but mm -hmm. it could can start. can look so many ways. Yeah, yeah it can. For those of us who do start with a conversation or even mm -hmm. for those of us who have that conversation, what are some tips that you have for navigating those conversations on grief definitely. and death? Um, so definitely I would say um, before you approach a conversation with someone who is like actively grieving or mourning, um, check in with yourself have a conversation with yourself before you talk to them. Um, and I would say, make sure that you're in the state of heart and mind to sit and listen to them um, and, and, and be there for them. And communication with other people is really important, but communicating with yourself before you have the conversation with somebody else, I think is the first place to start. Um, and then making sure you have your own support in place for you, right? Yes. You can't fill somebody else's cup unless your own cup is full first. So if you are not in a state of mind or heart to help somebody or listen to somebody who is in pain, please acknowledge that. Don't beat yourself up for it. It doesn't make you a bad friend or relative. It's okay if you can't be there for somebody else because of your own self, okay? Mm -hmm. Start there. Um, from there, there are ways and, and tips and things that I can kind of throw out there for y'all that I have learned over the years and that I have kind of gleaned from um, 
from funeral directors and um, grief therapists and counselors and stuff like that. So all this stuff is based on on real research and, and stuff that is kind of recommended to folks already. So a lot of it might sound familiar. Um, so I would say stay in the present or if your loved one is in the past, go there with them. So if, if you're trying to like have a conversation with somebody, you need to be there with them and you need to not be distracted by other shit. So that means like maybe turn your phone off. Maybe like make a quiet, cozy space where you can actually focus on that person with your full attention, right? Um, it might you, there might be moments where someone is talking and you want to interject and kind of lead it down a different path. Resist that urge. Resist it. You don't need to do anything. <laughs> this is about the other person, okay? Um, so, so if they're talking about a memory in the past, Go there with them in that memory. Ask them questions about it. Um, things like that. Um, you don't need to be perfect. And you don't need to have the perfect thing to say. Because there is no perfect thing to say. All right? So it's more than okay to say things like, I don't know what to say. And I don't know how to make this right. Mm -hmm. But I would like to be there for you right now. It's okay to say things like, I want to give you your privacy and your space but I'm also worried about you and I want to check in. How are you doing today? Um, you're probably going to feel uncomfortable. Own it. This shit is uncomfortable. Take a deep breath. You're okay. And just own that discomfort. Um, the biggest thing that I would say is to listen. Mm. Close your mouth and open your ears and let the other person's pain exist. Let it be present with you. Um, there's this really great quote by a grief counselor I really love. Um, her name is Megan Devine. And she said, um, when pain exists, let it exist. Bear witness. Make it safe for others to say this hurts without rushing to clean it up. Make space for each other. And that to me is really like the core of this. You need to make space for that other person to feel comfortable enough to talk about these feelings right so we can't make somebody's grief go away so all we can do really as as supporters and listeners is to show up help acknowledge that pain and sit and to listen um i really like to tell folks get consent before offering advice or solutions to a person who's grieving Consent is really important. You might have something that happened to you in your life and you got through it by doing this thing and it really helped you. And it can feel so like, this worked for me. I want to share it with this other person who's grieving because it might help mm -hmm. them. But you don't know how much research that other person has already done. You don't know unless you've communicated with them um, where where they're at with that. And so if you just rush in and start dumping all of these things onto them of, well, this worked for me and I think you should do this, it can feel really belittling. Mm -hmm. It can feel really diminishing, like somebody else is telling you how to feel and, and how you're going to feel better. And it's like they're speaking a different language and you're like, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, I'm doing what works for me. Um, so I think it's really important. Communicate and get consent. You can ask things like, uh, <clears throat> are you wanting empathy or a strategy right now? Mm -hmm. Just ask them that. They will be clear. They will say, no, I don't want your advice. I just want mm -hmm. you to listen. Please just yeah. listen. So yeah, what works for others doesn't necessarily work for you and vice versa. So please just like, Try to communicate with folks if you're trying to be there for them and find out what they need from you. Um, so yeah, platitudes would be the other one. Saying things like, they wouldn't want you to be sad or they're better off now. You'll feel better someday to someone who's just had someone die in their life. To me, when I heard that shit, I, I was 
so angry. (laughs) I thought my head was going to explode. For me, hearing that stuff was not a comfort. It didn't make me feel better. And and it didn't make my pain any less. It made me angry. Mm -hmm. That is not something that like you want to you want to cause in someone else. You don't want to make someone who's who's grieving angry, right? So mm-hmm. so so the best thing to do is just like leave the platitudes out. If if you're not sure what to say, say I'm not sure what to say and leave it at that. It's it's really simple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's with with these type of conversations, it's usually less about the supporter knowing what to say and more about learning how to listen. Um, choosing your words, I would say is something I really want to address, um, kind of with that. So finding out and respecting the type of language, um, to use with someone who's grieving can be really important. Um, some people might be more comfortable with the words loss or passed away. Other people might want to use the words death or dying. Some people experience tragic loss through through murder or war they might not want to say my loved one passed away they might want to say my loved one was murdered because that is a reflection of their life their situation their Mm -hmm. grief and experience so it's really important to to pay attention to your loved one and the words that they're using the language that they're using and use that language with them. Don't don't interject with your own language. Pick up on cues from that person and follow the griever's lead. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you with their body language, with with their words, what's comfortable for them. And if you don't know, you can ask, "What words are you most comfortable with me using?" or "What words do you not want me to use?" Mm-hmm. It's, it's hard to ask these questions because it's uh, it's uncomfortable. But there's no other way to know, right? How yeah. do we know if we don't ask? So mm-hmm. going into that, ask questions. That's where the bridge gets created between you and that other person, right? So while you're listening and you're taking cues and, and you're, you're, you're having this deep conversation, listening conversation with the person who's grieving, you can start to come up with questions real deep questions to to ask back to help uh, your loved one kind of through what they're talking about, right? Um, So with that, you have to give them the option to answer or not. You might ask a question that your loved one that's grieving doesn't want to answer, and you need to be okay with that. Don't Mm -hmm. take it personally. Like, it sucks because you want Maybe you want to know because you feel like you could better support your friend if only you knew. Don't pressure people to to answer things that they don't want to. If they say, you know what, I don't want to talk about that right now. Say, okay, do you want a hug? Can I bring you a cup of tea? Do you need a new box of tissues? Can I bring you some water? What can I do for you right now then? Um, I understand you don't want to answer these questions right now. I'm okay with that. Let me go back to being there for you in other ways. Um, it's okay to back off yeah. and give space. And grieving people often need space. Don't take it personally if you're supporting somebody and they ask you for space. It's a part of it. And it it's also something where if, if you're concerned that maybe your grieving loved one is spending a little too much time alone, you can say things like, you know, I'm I'm a little worried about you right now. I know you've been, you know, going through through your grieving process. Is there anything I can do for you? Do you need me to go pick up some groceries for you and drop them off at your door? Um, do you need me to, you know, run this errand for you? Do you want to sit on a video call with me and you can tell me about a book you're reading? Like, just reaching out like that. Um, can be very helpful. I notice you giving all of these examples. And this is something that we were um, a little bit of advice we had been given in our class as well when helping others grieve is not just say, what can I do for you? Because a lot of times grieving people Mm -hmm. like there's so much happening They're They're struck by grief. 
they don't yep. they can't answer that to everyone nope. they can't sit there and dictate where you go who does what who does what. you have to say it yes yeah, yeah. Give the, those ideas think of what yes. they need they need food what does a grieving person a mourning person need they need food they need emotional support they need to be hydrated yes um, and yes. that's so important looking out mm -hmm. for what they need and not just saying because i get that so many times and not just in when you, you lose someone but in so many other situations what can i do for you i don't i don't know i, don't I just yeah. want to like not to be yeah. dark but i just want to lay down and not you know yeah. sometimes you feel like you just you just mm -hmm. want to die. You don't want to exist. You don't want to like even yeah. think about it. And then people Absolutely. are like, well, what can I do? And you're like, fuck, nothing. I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know, nothing. Yeah. Go away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then you, yeah, it starts a cycle. And so, yeah, as the supporter, like exactly like you said, Lumi, you have to be the one to use your old thinker. And I know you all have them and think what does my friend or family member need on a daily basis what are what are really solid um difficult right now that maybe i can step in and you know what they they need a whole day because they want to to clean up their loved one's room after their loved one has died and they want to do that by themselves but they need their dog walked mm -hmm. i can do that i can mm -hmm. i can call them up and i can say you know what Cool. Pass me your dog out the front door. Awesome. Thanks. Here's my sanitizer wipes. Wipe your hands off. Walk their dog around the neighborhood. These are things that we can do for people even right now. As long as you're following <laughs> local guidelines <laughs> for, for all of COVID related things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, there are still physical acts of love that, that you can do for someone else. And, and that is literally bringing someone groceries because they are not in the mental capacity to go to the grocery store because every time they go, they have a panic attack because mm -hmm. being around that many people reminds them of their husband's funeral they just went to two mm -hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. This is real. This is stuff that people go through every single day and so learning these languages of communication around these hard topics i promise you all will help you moving forward with literally the rest of your lives like starting to have these internal conversations with yourself now and then learning how to extend those conversations outward to other people it's gonna it's gonna help you someday promise you um so yeah other other physical acts of love that kind of go into that write down important dates if you know yeah. the date that your friend's dad died write that date down in your calendar it's not morbid in fact when that anniversary comes up and maybe you're you're supposed to go out with your friend that day and your friend cancels you look at your calendar oh it's the anniversary of their dad's death Maybe I should call them and check in because obviously we're not going to go out and party tonight. Or maybe they do. Maybe they do want to go out and have that, you know, fun experience and just, you know, get out of their head a little bit. Or maybe they want to have a quiet night in instead. Maybe I should offer to do a video call with them and we sit and have a movie night together. Um, so they're not alone on that anniversary. Um, I think it's really important for us to not just forget about our our loved ones losses like remember those dates when when somebody else in your life experienced a loss remember that date and acknowledge it mm -hmm. oh my goodness if i could have somebody acknowledge like the anniversary of my aunt's death holy shit that would be amazing mm -hmm. but most people don't ask so most people don't know unless i talk about it right so it's one of those things where if we could just have a few more of these conversations everybody like i feel like could start to to really be there for each other and create an actual um network of support a real and deep and meaningful support network um which is what you're doing for someone who's grieving when you're doing all these acts and and, and being there for them and listening you're creating a network a safety web that's holding them up and that's going to help them adapt and transition like into their next their next walk of life, you know? 
Um, the new normal. Yeah. The new normal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. My new words. Thank you, Lumi. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, like my favorite. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That is. Yeah. And then I'm also a little bit mind blown. There are so many incredible um, questions and statements in chat that I want to bring in. Um, oh, I do so just want to acknowledge, Ian, you've been kind of doing that throughout this as well, um, COVID and how COVID changes this. We can still support our friends, as we talked about a little bit with the memorial earlier, that we can include people in that, or we can call them, we can still call them, we can still video chat with them, we can still check yeah. in with them. Um, I know that something we did recently that wasn't related to loss was um, but was still something that you could easily do um, was my niece made a cute little hair clip for one of her friends and we walked over to their house set it outside and then like they opened the door and we were you know appropriate distance away but to chatted mm -hmm. a little bit and then yeah. left and it was a really nice way to like get rid of yeah. that loneliness just a little bit push it back a little bit and i think I those like that. that can be very powerful and as you were saying the care package i think huge as you mentioned getting them groceries that could be really powerful right now as well mm -hmm. or or cooking them food would be mm -hmm. huge so um i oh, just yeah. wanted to acknowledge some of those covid things i don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that of while in this this shelter in place as many of us are is there anything additional you would want to add that people could do or do you feel like that covers a lot um, of them i did feel like we covered a lot of them um definitely think about um you know if if you're if you're dealing with a death yourself or you know a loved one in your family is dealing with a death right now um kind of going back to like how do we mourn during covid and stuff there's a lot of things you can do that are also like okay so let's say um your friend's parents died help them make a playlist with all of their parents favorite music on it right do things like that where you're like, oh, send me all of your parents' like list of favorite artists and bands and I'll make a playlist for you out of all of that music. That's such a beautiful thing and that's something you can do <laughs> from your own home and, and virtually send back to your friend. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, shareable compilations of photos and videos. Um, finding ways to connect virtually right now I think is going to be our our new normal for a little bit um and it's gonna be strange it's gonna be strange not to have um a whole lot of physical interaction beyond like i love what you just described lumi of going and um visiting but keeping the distance still being able to see their faces and talk with them for a little bit um things like that um i would say yeah i feel like we covered a lot yeah. of like the 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 physical acts of love and like i said it's gonna be different right now and it might it might not feel like it's good enough yeah. just remember that the days will keep coming and things will keep changing and at some point you will be able to go outside of your house again you'll be able to gather with your friends and family again. At some point in the future, you'll be able to, and you can mourn the death of your loved one at any point. It could be 20 years from now, and you could say, I'm gonna throw a funeral. I'm gonna have a wake. Why not? So don't feel like, like your grief needs to be put on hold just because your outward mourning needs to be put on hold but know that at some point you will have the time and the opportunity to to mourn your loss i don't know when that will be and that is the part that hurts a lot mm -hmm. but at some point the new normal will become a new new normal and things roll along so yeah absolutely yeah. 
Thank you, Mo. I want to bring, um, and mm -hmm. this would be the perfect time for questions. I want to bring a yeah. few of the things that people recently set up. I know I missed a lot of really beautiful things. Kaz said something much earlier as we were just starting the conversation, and I realized I needed a command to let you all know that we would get to your questions. I will pull in the most relevant ones as is possible. I don't want to continuously interrupt Mo. Um, <laughs> you are on a roll, and You're it's been fine. beautiful <laughs> to hear so much from you. Um, thank you. But oh, I wanted to acknowledge Wild Man Dan's statement and see if you had anything additional to say on it, Mo, because I think sure. it's very interesting and important. Wild Man Dan said, if someone grieving lashes out at your attempts to help, which can happen, don't get upset at them and understand that they are more lashing out at the circumstances than you. It's also a sign that they aren't ready to accept help yet. I think that's a... Yeah, that's mm, relevant. Yeah. I don't know if you had anything to add on to that. I don't think that I have had... Um, I don't know if I've had that experience. Well, I have had that with um, some shadow losses. And I think it's understandable. Uh, well, I it's absolutely understandable. We ultimately just want to be there for that person and, and not take it too personally. It can feel hurtful for us. And that's again when we fall back on our own um, our own support network, grounding ourselves, taking care of our emotions. And this is something I talk about during activism and during um, supporting trauma survivors is that mm -hmm. you might deal with some of their emotions and, and being able to ground yourself and make sure that you have the ability to do that at that point is really important. It's something I struggle with a ton. And I know like, I feel like right now I'm struggling with it in some instances in my own life currently is making mm -hmm. sure I, I am having the time for myself, taking care of the things I need to take care of, not losing sight of that, and finding ways to care for myself so that I can do that. Um, and it's hard, it's hard, especially yeah. I feel like as COVID is happening and we might have multiple people needing help, it's very, very difficult. But you know, keeping in mind what you can do and mm -hmm. adjusting as you need is going to be so important. That rolls right into another comment I really wanted to, or a question that I really mm -hmm. wanted to hear Mo's opinion on. Um, I think it's Foxygen Prime. I love that name, by the way. Um, they said, I have an uncomfortable question. Not sure if you are mm -hmm. taking questions. Is there a way to manage a friend who is consistently delivering bad news to you? They are just mm. a never ending li little outlet for sadness or hard times. Right. I'm nurturing and love lending an ear, but some people I fear I have a hard time getting out of that headspace and want to consistently discuss their trauma or, and sadness or issues. How do you establish healthy boundaries after this pattern forms? This is a tough one. This is such a tough one. Oh, Foxygen. That's a really tough situation because it's a delicate situation. I can tell from, from the way you phrase that, you love your friend. You love your friend very much. And I can tell that you want to be there for them. But you need to have a conversation with them, a very serious conversation, and you need to talk to them about those boundaries. And it, I can't tell you how to establish your boundaries, right? You need to come up with that yourself based on your friend because I don't know your friend and, and how you generally communicate with each other right so one way or another you need to talk to them and you need to express to them that while you love them and you want to support them and you want to be there for them they need to be aware that your cup is not always full and that means that you you are not always in that headspace to to handle that type of emotional dump. Um, my sister and I use a check in with each other um, where we'll text each other and we'll go, "Hey, are you in the headspace to talk right now?" And that means that one of us has something that we want to talk about that's gonna be weighty. That's probably gonna require a little bit more emotional capacity, a little bit more 
whew, better take some deep breaths. This is going to be a tough conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so my sister and I came up with essentially a, a code word sentence before we, we start the conversation with each other. Um, before one of us starts unloading on the other person, we check in first and say, are you in the place to do this right now? Are, are you feeling okay? Like talking about this stuff when the other person says no, you have to respect it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can take training because for me and my sister, it took us years. I mean, because we would just text each other, call each other and dump on each other. And then we started to realize like, this isn't helping because sometimes the other person isn't in the right place to listen or help or even be there for us. And it's not, it's just too much. So I think that, yeah, you need to, you need to talk with your friend and, and draw those lines and say, look, can you, can you ask me before dumping on me? Can you just communicate with me a little bit more and say, hey, I'm not feeling good today. Can you talk today? Because then that's giving you the opportunity to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. and, and your friend really needs to get consent from you before overloading you with stuff. And that's really hard. It's really hard to have these conversations with our, our loved ones and our Absolutely. friends. Absolutely. So I hope it helped a little. Yeah, Foxygen, I wish you the best of luck on that. It is a very difficult thing. And it's something I feel like, especially those of us who, it's interesting, I hear from a lot of people like, you're such a good listener. And then I have people who come back to me just for that. And it, it ends up feeling like this is our only interactions and it's very exhausting. And so something that I've been trying to do and I, and then on the flip side, I have a particular friend I know I go to because he does that for me. And I don't, you know, I don't always feel like I can go to people because they, they suck at listening, right? Or they <laughs> feel they seem maybe a little dismissive. So then I feel yeah. like I'm always dumping on that person. And so it's like, I see both sides of this. And so as being that person who just does the dumping, if, if any of you in chat are that person, don't worry, you can fix it and, and be mindful of it. And I just start thinking, okay, well, what are things yeah. that this person cares about? What can I um, what can we connect on other than this? What do we enjoy doing? Okay, in my head, I realize, okay, I am going to spend this amount of time having this conversation. And after that, because I know I can rant about this for ages, right? I have so <laughs> many emotions to unpack, but I don't want to just right. dump this all on one person and talk, cry to them for five hours. That's fine sometimes, right? But not mm -hmm. all the time. So it's like, okay, I am going to spend the first 30 minutes and I'm just going to unpack all of the most important things I really need to tell this person. And then I want to turn and die in League of Legends, you know, <laughs> or, or, and then yes, we're going to talk outlets. about gardening or cooking. Yeah. And, and make yep. sure that it's a thing you can share together mm -hmm. on the flip side, maybe saying, Hey, I want to spend this time like with that person that you want to establish those boundaries with maybe carve out time. Like I want to do this with you then, you know, um, or if you can have that frank conversation with them. I know I have a friend who who kind of did the reverse in that this isn't as serious and maybe not as touchy of a topic, but they were coming together and all they did were was complain about work. And they said, OK, we're going to have yeah. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Each of us are going to complain about work. And then from there, we're going to like leave it behind and move forward. Get it out. Yeah. That's going to be a little harder, I think, to establish when it's a one sided thing, because it might seem like you're calling them out more, but you do need to say, hey, mm. I have a limited, and, and this, I think is, this is the honesty in this conversation. It's just saying, I, I also, you know, I have my needs and I'm struggling to support you to this depth. And I'm worried because this is always my problem. I'm worried yeah. I'm going to cut you off. I don't want to yeah. do that because I care deeply for mm -hmm. you. So let's make this work for both of us. Oh, and, and here's <laughs> what I can give and here's what I can't give. And it's, it's a painful conversation to have. It's a hard conversation to have, but it's so important. And, and that's what I always say when you're dealing with um, trying to assist trauma survivors is as soon as you know your boundaries, set them. 
not and it feels mm -hmm. cold but remind yourself it's, it's not because otherwise you might give them too much and have to have this conversation where you take away or you might hit that breaking point where you hurt yourself badly doing all of this and you have to cut off from them and that is going to be so intensely painful for the both of you and so it's it's really kindness though it might not feel that way um it's such a hard thing to deal with though such a hard thing to deal with and mo thank you um as well it was really cool to hear you talk about this because this is something i struggle with a lot on so many issues yeah yeah it's yeah. a tough one uh, Super tough. yeah absolutely um so someone is said if oh, ch -ch -ch, mo how do you deal with grief popping back up after you think you've dealt with it Oh, oh, so there's grief and then there's complicated grief or complex grief. And this is something that a lot of people deal with for their whole lives, um, particularly if you already deal with issues of anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, without that extra grief factor when you are grieving and you have all those things, it can really start to compound on itself. And then even if you don't have um, anxiety, depression, PTSD, any other like underlying stuff to kind of exacerbate that grief, like over a long period of time, the grief can still persist. And that's when it's complicated grief or complex grief. Um, so that's when maybe uh, five years go by and you know what, you're doing pretty good. You're feeling, you're feeling okay. And then it hits you out of nowhere, like a truck. And you are feeling all of the feelings as if that loved person just died yesterday. And it's that real and that raw. And all of a sudden you're just tossed back into it. That's complex grief. And that's when things like that can keep coming up and keep happening for many years throughout your life. I would say if you're experiencing complicated grief, you need to find a a real professional grief counselor or therapist. Um, I truly believe that you can learn how to manage and slowly work through those moments, even when they're unexpected, with the right support system and the right tools. However, talking with a professional is a whole different level of winding that unraveled yarn ball and putting putting it back together in a way that can really, really help you in ways that advice on the internet and a random streamer named Mo just can't help you with. <laughs> so if you're experiencing grief that is ongoing or grief that keeps popping up unexpectedly over and over and over again, and then you feel better and then it comes back, find a professional. There are professional grief counselors online. There are professionals who offer um, small classes and courses and groups of, you know, six people or less, or maybe just you and the therapist. There are all kinds of ways um, to go about it. Please, like, talk with a real professional about it because they will be able to give you insights and, and help in ways that you just won't find on Google, you know what I mean? They they help you in a very personalized way. And and that's really important um, to remember is that your grief is your own and you know it's it's gonna look a certain way for you. And so finding a professional who can look at that with you and and come up with 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 a personal plan for you and a personal tool belt for you to kind of help adapt through through these changes and through those really hard times. That's what I'm always going to go back to with complex grief is seek out a professional. I'm somebody who has complex grief. Um, talking with professionals, I feel like saved my life in a very little, literal way. So it can be overwhelming and it can be really scary. And I also understand that with that, there are a lot of people who don't have access to good health care, yeah. um, good mental health care, um, good therapy, maybe, you know, that there's so many factors. So 
I am so sorry if you're someone who is stuck in a situation right now where you are unable um, to to get to that professional, but please hang in there. Please know that like there are people out there who can help you through those really complicated times, um, no matter how long it's been since the death you've experienced or loss you've experienced in your lives. That's Absolutely. What I would Thank it's you a so really much. good question. Um, it is. Really and um, you went on the complicated grief side. I want to just pull out, like even with some losses with a, a partner, um, like I, I've lost a partner through a breakup, right? I'll experience some sadness sometimes at that loss yeah. a long time afterwards. And I, I yeah. uh, what was the metaphor she used? I always think of like, waves and how it's like at first it's going to be a huge wave that just devastates you and then the waves will mm -hmm. get softer and just observing yeah. those waves and and rebuilding after those waves and acknowledging that those waves are going to come and that's okay that's yeah. okay so if it's not something as serious as as moa's was referring to know that that is totally normal yep and um and you know, I I always think of this too because I think, okay, I I wanna I wanna pack it up real neatly. Okay, this is my sadness. I did the thing. Work. It's gone, and, and it, it isn't like that. It keeps coming out, and it keeps coming out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you think the waves get smaller, and then all of a sudden you're just you hear that song, and you're just crushed yeah. again. Yeah. But know that slowly it will get lesser. Um, if if that that is your case if not then you yeah. might be experiencing what mo's talking about i've never heard of that yeah. thank you so much mo yeah um, it's it's really important and, yeah. to talk about for sure and then also what what you were saying lumi about just grief not having um an end date or an expiration date mm -hmm. there is no neat package where you just get to tie the ribbon on top and 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 that's it you're done grief is over no it doesn't work that way we love and we grieve yeah. because we love. And if you still have that feeling inside of you of, oh, I loved this person and I still love them now, of course you're going to feel grief even years, years on. And, and I love what you were saying, Lumi, about the waves because eventually in a lot of ways it does become just small, you know, small ones kind of lapping at the beach, kind of like touching your toe a little bit instead of completely overwhelming you mm -hmm. um, with, you know, with that force and like intensity. And for a lot of people, that's that's really what it does become is this, you, you feel the water touch your toes and you go, oh, yeah, I still feel that. I still feel it. It's not as painful as that first day, but it's still there. Yeah. That's love hanging on, you know. And that connection in your heart that you had to that person and that like lumi said that is natural and normal to to feel grief even you know years or months and and alternatively if you don't if somebody in your life dies and you don't feel anything it's okay it's okay there's a lot of people that that kind of go on the opposite end of that where they experience a loss and it's not apathy, it's shock. Like your brain and, and your body are in shock and, and in, in a lot of ways, denial. And so um, your, your brain can really push back a lot of your emotions for a time and kind of keep them at bay in order to protect. You're, you're protecting yourself like subconsciously um, by, by not allowing any emotions in. And so if somebody in your life dies and, and you feel empty, you're not unnatural. You are not an un unnatural human. You are experiencing things in your way. And many people often experience that sense of emptiness. So we're talking a lot about, about these feelings of pain and loss and intense emotion, but it's really important to recognize that there are many people that experience a, a loss and don't feel that impact for a while you know, sometimes it can take days. So it's important. I feel like it's important to acknowledge that. We're yeah, also different. absolutely. Absolutely. I know a lot of people can feel um, 
confusion or, or anger at themselves for experiencing the wrong emotions. I should feel right. this way. I should feel that way. No, not should. necessarily. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of that should. I try to get rid of should out of all yeah. of my um my my framings of the world period like mm -hmm. my sentences and everything and some people say well are you saying that i should get rid of the word should and i say no i think that it would be beneficial for you to get rid of the word should yeah. if you would like to <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. So yeah i think it's a very powerful shift um because it I just agree. adds on guilt where there might not need to be like um like an outward pressure that mm -hmm. we put onto ourselves um, to meet some sort of expectation but you're not your grief it, you're not expected to look or feel any particular way during your grief and and that's a, a lot of people are like oh well you should feel the five stages and all these things and no 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 it's going to be up and down. It's going to be all over the place. Everybody's going to look different. And then coming back to that place of, well, everybody's grief looks different. Everybody experiences this. So it's still a collective thing that we can all kind of recognize and, and, and just a crazy other, SJ right? dub monster. So it's individual, but it wants to indoctrinate your children. All of us. You guys <laughs> should subscribe to Thank Lumi you. though. Um, moving on to Twisted Tensor's question. After a sudden death in my family, we all realize that any of us could die at any time and at any age. And now a lot of us have a lot more anxiety about death. How do you cope with the knowledge that you can lose anyone unexpectedly at any time? That's a great question. Um, I think that's going to look individual for each person who is, is learning how to cope with that knowledge. Um, for me, that's been a lifelong everyday journey. I call it my journey with death. We go through a journey in life, but the minute we're born, we start our journey with death too. And it's there by our side the whole time and up until the day that we die. And so it's one of those things where for me, educating myself and, and learning more about death and dying in, in a scientific way learning about biology learning about the the physical process of what happens during a quote unquote natural um old age death what happens during um a more traumatic death and for me personally learning more about things in a factual real world way as well as having that go in tandem with going to therapy and um finding appropriate ways to process my my grief from the deaths in my life previously have have all kind of helped me to understand that at any point in in my own life someone could die um the people in my life who have died have died very unexpectedly so i understand that and it's a real fear mm -hmm. it's a real fear of just fuck, am I going to wake up tomorrow and the person I love isn't going to be here anymore? That's a struggle. And it might be a struggle that some people just have forever. I have a lot of anxiety about loved ones in my life dying. However, educating myself about many different things about death and dying, the, the emotional aspects, physical aspects, all kinds of things, and finding the right resources to, to, to learn from have really, really helped me um, to take a deep breath and, and realize that our, I had no control over being born. <laughs> and, and when I die, that, that's when my time will come. And the same is true of the people in my life. And, and there are things I can do to sort of um, prepare myself and plan a little bit in advance before those things happen with the knowledge that it could happen and be an emergency situation um i know my my partner and i talk all the time about um pre-planning our own deaths we're young we're healthy we're fine but it's still a thought of well what if one of us got into an accident this is important it's important to to sit down and say this is what um i want done with my body what do you want done with your body? And he'll tell me and we'll be like, cool, let's write this down in our advanced directive. Um, so 
having like access to knowledge and resources and and kind of allowing myself space to explore these topics without judging myself without calling myself weird or morbid or crazy or any words like that kind of lets you um make space to understand these things a little better and understanding things better can sometimes help ease some anxiety at least for me <laughs> um if i if i know about something it can really help me so it's different for everybody though and that's such a tough one it's it's gonna be hard no matter what and you can plan all you want but it doesn't take um that pain away when it does happen i know absolutely absolutely thank you um, mm -hmm. so I, I don't have any experience on that one personally. I, I just don't, yeah. I appreciate you being able to take that one. Um, I, and it's interesting that I don't, because I lost someone very suddenly and it still doesn't feel real, but I just, I don't know what, what I wonder about that. Why don't I have that struggle? Cause I feel like that's such a natural thing to come up, but it doesn't for me. And I guess I'm lucky in that sense. Um, however, yeah. thank you for your words, Mo, and for explaining yeah. that, because I, I would have been at a loss. Um, of course. I hope it helped a little. I think that that sounded super, super helpful, in my opinion. Okay. But um, let me, I know Kez asked a question, and I feel like I just lost it. I think, Kez, oh yeah, how does Mo feel about assisted dying? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. So that's something that I'm still doing a lot of research on. Um, I, I follow on social media a lot of um, palliative care providers, um, hospice providers, um, in general, just people who work with death and dying with people. These are the type of people that I really like to um, explore what they have to say, um, the stories they have to tell and experiences. Um, palliative care providers are people who literally are there for thousands of people's deaths. Um, one of them, Catherine Mannix, she is incredible. And she, um, she has been there for over 14,000 people's deaths assisted their families you know with with their their end of life care and stuff like that so when it comes to things like assisted dying i i've been doing research in the perspective from like the palliative care and hospice people because generally when you when we talk about assisted dying we're not talking about a 20 year old going in and and, and asking a doctor to help them die we are talking about people who are already at the end of their life right and it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of people want that autonomy with their body. They want to be able to make that choice and say, I have had cancer for six years. I already know that I have three months left to live. I'm done. I've done what I want to do with my life. I'm where I want to be. And I'm ready. I don't want to be in pain anymore. I don't want to be in, in assisted care. I'm ready to go. Who am I to tell that person that they're wrong for that? You know, like, how could I judge another person at the end of their life and in that circumstance, like, saying that they're ready? Like, that's, so for me, I, I have a lot of respect for people who, who are able to to make those type of requests and not everywhere in the US I think it's like not everywhere in the US they'll they'll do assisted dying I think it's like certain hospitals certain doctors there's like a lot of stuff about it that I don't know like the logistics and legalities of um there's a lot that goes into that too so it's a very tricky subject on on the legal level logistical level emotional level um and yeah just figuring out how much control do we actually have over our lives is a really fascinating question to me mm -hmm. um to explore um which you know when we're talking about the end of somebody's life and someone deciding to do assisted dying it doesn't get much more autonomous than that like you're literally choosing i'm ready to go 
So yeah, the, the whole topic is super fascinating to me. Long story short, I haven't formulated an opinion. I'm still learning. And I think I'm going to be formulating that opinion for a long time because it is such a deeply complex subject. Truly, it is. Um, Absolutely. But I, I usually look towards the people who who are kind of involved with end of life care already to help educate me about those type of things. I really appreciate, yeah, I really appreciate that perspective going to the people who would, who would know and who face that um, and, and help people through their death um, so regularly. I know that Oregon, you were talking a little bit about the legalities. Oregon has the, um, I think it's death with, with dignity. It's very rare mm -hmm. in the United States that you can have. Very rare. Um, very rare. But Oregon is one of those places that has that. And I watched a documentary that followed a few people who did choose or almost chose and still has the potential to take that path. And at the beginning of the, the right. documentary, taking you through watching video of someone choosing to use that method and why yeah. and all the complex yeah. emotions around it. And it really helped me yeah. realize that for terminal illnesses, I heavily support it. And yeah. I I heavily support yeah. um, <clears throat> us expanding that into the, the United States as a whole. And I know that I've considered moving to Oregon for that reason when yeah. I get older. Because if I oh, have something... Great. Yeah, I, if I have something terminal like that, um, and I know it's going to be a very long and painful death, I've watched yeah. people go through that. And I, yeah. I don't think it's, that's not the best mm -hmm. choice we can offer people. Um, and that right. would not be the choice I would want to go through. So mm -hmm. or the the path I would want to go down. So it's a very complicated conversation. But it's something yeah. that I'll probably if you ever do more research, and I'm sure you'll take a while to oh, get into it. But yeah, that is a whole more. stream topic I would <laughs> love to dive into because I am Let's do it. <laughs> deeply passionate about that. And then also the ties yeah. to um, the complexities of just suicide as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there are so many conversations yes. you and I oh. still need to have and bring to the community. So many conversations. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, wow, I wanted to... Such good questions. <laughs> yeah, we have so many good questions still here. I wanted to go ahead and say, you know, we have covered a lot of the pressing topics now i appreciate yeah. your time today i do want to get back to chat and have a bit yeah. more conversation with them we have another topic to move into but thank you so much for joining us yeah. i know i'll be inviting you to join us again i hope that you will um but I no will. pressure yeah oh, yeah an honor. 